I'm sick. My voice is ratchet, my eyes are bloodshot, but we've got Harry Potter content to film. As always, just a reminder, I love this series. I love this book. I have a much longer video that I posted yesterday talking all about how amazing this book is and how much I enjoyed reading it. So go check that out. I'll link it in the corner as well as in the description if you want a more well-rounded version of how I feel about this book. But this video is dedicated specifically to the parts of this book that don't quite fit just right. If you're new to this series, I will also have linked in the description and in the corner a playlist for all of my videos, all of my gushing, happy reviews of how much I love these books, as well as all of my doesn't make sense videos. Again, this is all just for fun. Let's talk about the things that don't fit perfectly. And we're going to start way back in the Dursley's house on page 53, at least in my copy. Harry has just fought off some Dementors and then gotten a letter saying, your wand's about to be broken, you're about to be expelled, have fun with that. And then he sent another letter saying, none of those things are going to happen, stay put, just We'll, we'll deal with it. Then members of the order show up at his house to take him safely to their hideaway. All of this is great until Tonks starts helping him pack his bags. Don't be stupid, it'll be much quicker if I pack, cried Tonks, waving her wand in a long sweeping movement over the floor. floor. Books, clothes, telescopes, and scales all soared into the air and flew pell-mill into the trunk. Okay, so we already know how the trace works a little bit from book two. The trace, for some reason, isn't actually on the wizard's wand, but it's on the person of the miner. So when Dobby does a hover charm in Harry's house around Muggles, Harry gets a written warning of, you just performed magic, don't do it again or you'll be expelled or something will happen. I don't remember how they worded it. This wasn't fair because Harry didn't perform the magic, but nobody cared. Nobody wanted to hear that there was a house elf that showed up randomly at his house because all they know is there's one wizard in this house, one spell was performed, it was you, you're in trouble. So we know that the trace is on the person of Harry. We know that Harry was warned, don't do any magic. We're trying to convince the ministry not to break its own laws and we're trying to convince the ministry to leave you alone and not expel you and not break your wand over this. Don't perform any more magic. It'll only make things worse. So what does Tonks do? She performs magic around him in his muggle house. The ministry doesn't know Tonks is there. The ministry doesn't know that the Dursleys are gone. All the ministry knows is Dumbledore is fighting his case trying to keep him in the school and keep his wand intact. But the ministry would know that Tonks just performed magic around him in his muggle house where his muggle family is supposed to be, and yet nobody cares. There's no consequence for this. The fudge doesn't care that there's magic being performed here. And if something happened, if some sort of protective spell some, somehow was performed to keep the ministry from knowing about it, we should have been informed of this because this doesn't make any sense. Next, we once again see Lupin's Bogart not perform normally. So if you didn't watch my book three uh, review, it doesn't make sense bit. Uh, Lupin's Boggart doesn't make any sense. So basically when a Boggart is in, in the area, um, it, it transforms into whatever it thinks the person's greatest fear is, is going to be. So let's say it's Professor Snape and Neville's response to it would be to wave his wand, say ridiculous, and then Professor Snape is suddenly dressed like Neville's grandmother. Then you have to laugh at it. Now your greatest fear has become funny, so you laugh, and that is the Boggart's greatest weakness. Laughter will break it down until finally it just gives up and disappears. Not so with Lupin. Every time Lupin comes across a Boggart in book three, he says, he waves his wand and says ridiculous, and then the Boggart transforms into a moon, which it should have transformed into before, before Lupin said ridiculous. But instead, it becomes his fear when he's trying to fight his fear off even though his fear wasn't there before. And then when he says ridiculous, the moon never does anything. I know in the movies, it kind of like pops and flows around the room. That doesn't happen in the books. In the books, it just stays a moon. And then he just tries to shove it into a trunk or something like that. He tries to get rid of it by forcing it away instead of by the way Boggart's work. My review for book three will be up there if you if you want to see what I'm talking about. So once again, we're with a Boggart. Molly, oh, sweet Molly Weasley has uh, just 
witnessed all of her family dying because that's her bogger. Lupin had come running into the room, closely followed by Sirius, with Moody stomping along behind him. Lupin, Lupin looked from Mrs. Weasley to the dead Harry on the floor and seemed to understand in an instant. Pulling out his wand, he said very firmly and clearly, ridiculous. Harry's body vanished. A, sil a silvery orb hung in the air over the spot where it had laid. Lupin waved his wand once more and the orb vanished in a puff of smoke. This is not how boggarts work. Why would it, why would he say ridiculous and then it turns into Lupin's greatest fear and then he just waves his wand and it disappears in a puff, in a puff of smoke? That did not, never did that happen in book three. For whatever reason, boggarts are weird with Lupin and we never get an explanation why. Now let's talk about the OWLs because oh my goodness, there's, there's just this big gaping thing in this school system. Obviously, we already know that in Hogwarts, we never get any mention of them learning anything about math or English or any subject that we learn about in the Muggle world. They only have their magical subjects, which are important, but also one would think that other things might be relevant too. I mean, do wizards genuinely only have a 10 year old understanding of math or do we just never see the math classes or even hear about them all throughout the school? That's odd. I've never really brought it up in a, in a video because whatever, it's silly. But the thing is with these OWLs, they're only just now getting their career cards. They're getting these pamphlets about their careers and about what they need in order to pursue a career. So let's say a student wants to be an RR, like Harry mentions that he wants to do. They find out in fifth year what it takes to be an RR. You have to take these secondary classes. And there are multiple career choices that the kids pick up and look at and they're like, ooh, this sounds interesting. Ah, but you need arithmetic for this. And we didn't take this or ah, but you need divination for this and Hermione didn't take that one. So they determine their electives in book three, if I'm not mistaken. Their secondary classes that they're gonna start taking there that, that are optional, that they must choose which ones they're gonna go through. Yeah, definitely book three. They determine those two years before they find out what careers actually matter for these classes. What if you decided I'm gonna take divination and muggle studies and then two years later you get your pamphlets about careers and you're supposed to decide which career you wanna pursue and you decide, oh, I wanna pursue this one but you need arithmetic for it. For, so for the past two years, I've been screwing myself out of the career that I'm actually the most interested in because I didn't even know when I selected these classes what they were relevant toward. It just seems like these electives these secondary classes either should all be mandatory or you should know in advance which classes are going to be relevant for which careers because you can't even pursue a certain career if you haven't been taking an elective for two years that you didn't even know was applicable to that career. It's just such an odd way of structuring things. Now we need to talk about how Harry and the entire DA were caught because that's a little bit messy too. So first we have when they're actually in their DA meeting and then Dobby crashes the meeting to say, hey, just so you know, Umbridge is coming. She's found out about you, run. He says, Dobby has come to warn you, but the house elves have been warned not to tell. Jump forward a little bit and now we've got Umbridge talking. She says, Mrs. Edgecombe here came to my office shortly after dinner this evening and told me she had something she wanted to tell me. Hop forward a little bit more and we have Mrs. Edgecope tipped me off and I proceeded at once to the seventh floor, accompanied by certain trustworthy students, so as to catch those in the meeting red-handed. So how do how did Dobby and other house, house elves make it into the mix? Mrs. Edge, Miss Edgecombe went to Umbridge's office immediately shortly after dinner. So we know that Umbridge was told in her office about this. About, about the DA meetings. Yet we also know that Umbridge told the house elves, multiple house elves, not to tell anyone about what she just heard and then went straight to the, uh, the DA meeting accompanied by the Slytherins that she grabbed. So what's going on here? Did Umbridge get told about the DA meeting and then ran to the kitchens and said, hey house elves, here's what's going on don't tell anyone, then ran to the Slytherin common room, then ran to the DA giving Dobby time to come and tell on her. Did she, was she having a cup of tea with Dobby and a few other random house elves? And when Miss Edgecombe came in, she was like, don't mind the house elves. They're fine to listen to this too. And then she told them don't tell anyone. And then she ran to the Slytherin common room and then went to Harry. I mean, just it's, it's, What's going on here? Genuinely, I can't think of a single scenario where this makes sense that the house elves are 
are informed about this at all. Even if Umbridge, for whatever reason, decided to call the house elves, multiple house elves to her office to clean up some mess, which doesn't make sense because that's not how the house elves are used. They're used for general cleaning. They're supposed to say out of the eye of everyone else, which is why we don't even know that house elves are employed in Hogwarts until book four. They're not supposed to be seen and they're not called to clean up random messes. Anytime there's ever any mess in the, in Hogwarts, we always see people either vanish the mess away or reparo the object that's been broken. So there's literally no reason for Umbridge to call a house elf, multiple house elves, to her office and tell them to clean up a mess that she could clean up with magic. But let's say she's on a power trip. Let's say Umbridge just decides, I don't feel like vanishing this spill away. I want not one, but I want more than one house elf to come into my office to do a job that I could do in 0, 0.0 seconds. I'm gonna have them do it. And then I'm gonna let them sit in when Miss Edgecombe comes into my office. I'm gonna let them hang out and listen when she says she has something really important to tell me. I just, there's no, there's there's no scenario where it makes sense that there are multiple house elves hanging out in Umbridge's office while she's told about the DA meetings and Dobby has the ability. And then she tells Dobby and the other house elves apparently, don't tell anyone and then runs to the Slytherin common room and then runs to the DA. Like it just, there's no reason Dobby should be in on this to warn them. And last, we need to talk about the final scenes here in the ministry, the Department of, of Mysteries. <sighs> we have the moment when uh, Harry and the gang are confronted by the Death Eaters and uh, Harry finds out that the only people that are able to actually get the prophecy are the people that the prophecy is about. So Harry says, why did Valdi come and get it himself? They responded, the Dark Lord walk into the Ministry of Magic when they're so sweetly ignoring his return? The Dark Lord reveal himself to the Aurors when at the moment they are wasting their time on my dear cousin? So Bellatrix actually said that about like all of the Death Eaters collectively, which I think is a little bit silly. Obviously, all of these Death Eaters, like literally dozens of Death Eaters, I think it talks about how Dumbledore captured like 10 of them. So at least 12, we've got at least 12 Death Eaters that have made it into the ministry undetected. So obviously they have a way in to come in undetected that isn't a high risk. Sure, maybe there's still some risk that they'll be detected, but obviously this is a really good plan and they can do it. So instead of Valdi saying, okay, there's some risk here that I might be seen, but not a big risk and a dozen of my Death Eaters can come in undetected, so I probs could too. Let me just go get the prophecy myself. Instead, he once again comes up with this elaborate, unnecessary, months-long thing. It's like it's like we're back in book four when Valdi has this elaborate thing that goes on for months about Harry, like trying to get Harry through the tournament and and convincing other people to help him get through the different tasks so that he can get the cup so that he can be transported to the graveyard. When Barty Crouch Jr. could have made any object in his in his office a port key and sent Harry there at the beginning of, like it just, Valdi and his elaborate schemes. We're doing it again. Once again, once again, Valdi is sending visions to Harry for months, trying to get him into the Department of Mysteries, trying to show him where the prophecy lies, trying to entice him to go get it himself, and then telling him, oh, well now I'm torturing Sirius in this Department of Mysteries, so you should come, you gotta come. All this work so that he can get Harry to finally get into the Department of Mysteries, and hopefully he'll come undetected, hopefully nobody will stop him, and then he'll get the prophecy, and then hopefully my Death Eaters will be able to get it from Harry without damaging the prophecy, without it getting smashed, even though it's so super breakable. There's this tiny little bitty risk that Voldemort may be caught if he gets into the ministry the same way that all his Death Eaters could do easily without being noticed. He has a tiny little risk. So instead, he creates this elaborate scheme that takes months to execute that is way more risky because he's depending on Harry actually doing the thing he wants and then not smashing the prophecy in the process of all this. He's gonna risk way more and take way longer to do it even though he could easily do it himself and almost certainly not be detected. He's like, I don't wanna try, let's let's do it the hard way. And then after his plan fails and the prophecy is smashed, which of course it is, then he shows up anyway. He goes, now, now that the mission has failed and now that he doesn't have the prophecy because he decided to do it the hard way, he shows up in the ministry 
anyway. Even though now he's way more at risk of being caught, he decides, I'm angry, let me hang out. Can I, Potter? said a high, cold voice. Months of preparation, months of effort. And my Death Eaters have let Harry Potter thwart me again. No, friend, you let yourself be thwarted. You obviously can show up in the ministry on a moment's notice. You just chose not to. You just chose to let it all be up to Harry once again. You chose to make your plan go months long, even though it would have been super easy to do it in a minute, once again. And then after the plan failed, because of course it's gonna fail if you do this elaborate nonsensical plot. After it failed, you show up anyway and get caught because you're mad. This is why Voldemort is significantly less scary than his followers. He's so dumb. So there you go. My voice is almost gone, but we got through it. These are the things in book five that don't quite fully make sense. I'd love to chat with you more about them in the comments. Once again, I love this book. Go check out the review where I talk about how amazing it is. I just also enjoy talking about this stuff because it's fun. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. See you guys again soon. Bye.